I'm pleased to introduce our co-moderators for this panel, Sky Miller and Janine Mans. Sky serves as Knowledge Management and Learning Officer on our Anti-Corruption Task Force. And Janine is a Senior Governance Advisor in USAID's DRG Center and is currently serving as an Integration Officer on the Anti-Corruption Task Force. Over to you, Sky, to kick off our session. Thanks so much uh, for the introduction, Jen. Uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening, colleagues. Um, I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel alongside my colleague, Janine Manns, as Jen said. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on a central topic in this week's discussions, really a thread throughout, um, including our last session, that is measurement and evaluation. Uh, we all know that measuring corruption and measuring and evaluating the impact of anti-corruption activities is notoriously difficult. Many of you have seen third-party indicators measuring both corruption and anti-corruption, some of which we'll discuss today. And the anti-corruption community has worked in recent years to develop more custom activity-specific metrics for monitoring and, ev and evaluation. To make progress on this issue, USAID has undertaken several initiatives. I wanted to highlight a few recent examples to frame our discussion today. First, the agency commissioned a practitioner guide for anti-corruption programming in 2015, that includes a section on monitoring and evaluating results. The Anti-Corruption Task Force is in the process of updating this guidance. The agency has also supported a handful of global and regional evaluations or reviews of anti-corruption programming in the last two decades. Second, as colleagues mentioned on days one and two of our learning week, the DRG Center's Learning Evidence and Analysis Platform, or LEAP, has metrics related to corruption in country data portraits and indicator inventories. The LEAP will also soon include a link to a governance evidence gap map with corruption related impact evaluations and systematic reviews, as we discussed on Tuesday. USAID's DRG Center also completed an impact evaluation retrospective with implications for anti corruption programming. There are two key um, important takeaways. One, it is possible to conduct rigorous impact evaluations of anti corruption programming, and USAID may wish to commission more of these evaluations in the future. Two, we've learned a lot about how to do and use impact evaluations. Evaluations should be based on an evaluability assessment, engage mission and implementing partner stakeholders, emphasize a clear objective and develop a utilization plan. I hope this issue of how evaluations are utilized is one that we can touch on as we proceed in our discussion today. The last set of initiatives I want to highlight are the many m and activities USAID missions have engaged in, ranging from surveys to project monitoring to evaluations. We'll highlight a few pieces of learning from these efforts today. Building on our work today, we must continue to make steps to improve how we measure and evaluate our anti-corruption programming. This is all the more vital as we set out to implement the USG's new anti-corruption strategy. Many of the metrics we use are input or output level indicators, and they do not capture outcomes. As all of us know, outputs only give us a piece of the picture. Likewise, our evaluations often do not measure whether we've had impact, how, and why. We need stronger measurement and evaluation approaches to understand where we are moving the needle and where we still have work to do. I'll just note that several academics have urged introspection among the anti-corruption community, given the lack of aggregate progress on how we can control corruption by some measures. It is hard for us to know whether we've made an impact without more rigorous reviews. Um, so before we begin our panel, um, we'll just have a, a quick poll question for the audience just to get a sense of, of where folks are coming from on this issue and what you're most interested in. Um, can we have a screen share of the, the poll, please? So as these come in, we'll just kind of reflect. Um, we're, we're really asking the question, um, which of the following approaches to, to m and &E of corruption and anti-corruption are you most interested in learning uh, more about? So let's uh, see what folks say through the poll. Perfect, okay, great. Looks like right now we have um, leveraging local partners to build the evidence base um, and adaptive management uh, based on monitoring data is the two Leading areas, continue refreshing, okay. <laughs> um, all these things are important, so it's unsurprising that we start to see um, uh, you know, a bit of variation in our answers. Uh, a few more people wanting to um, look to how we make performance evaluations more useful, um, research practitioner learning, use of RCTs, but it looks like still adaptive management is um, the leading. Let's refresh it one more time just to see if it changes and then we can move on. Okay, good. Um, this is really 
really helpful and hopefully informative for our, our panel discussion. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting into the, the conversation. Um, and right now I'm gonna turn over to Janine to introduce our distinguished panelists and, and lead the discussion. Janine, over to you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sky, for that excellent framing of the discussion. And, and I'm really so pleased to have with us three experts today, each of which really bring a unique and, and a complementary perspective on what's needed to conduct more meaningful measurement and evaluation of corruption issues. Uh, first off, we have from Global Integrity, uh, Johannes Tun, who will be sharing a bit about his work on the Africa Integrity Indicators Project and the Global Integrity Anti-Corruption Evidence Program. From USAID Ukraine, we're joined by Paola Pavlenko, uh, who will be speaking to the challenges and benefits of generating evidence in health sector anti-corruption programming. Thanks for joining. And, and finally, we are lucky to have um, Sherry Erasmus joining us from Integrity Lab. She'll be sharing with us some of their new work on the tricky issue of attribution when looking at improvements in addressing corruption. Short bios for each of our panelists are provided on the day four landing page for this evidence and learning week. Now, as we go through the panel, I wanna ask you to go ahead and please start adding our questions for our panelists. You don't need to wait till the end. Um, you can use the Google form that's being shared in the chat now. Our colleague, Angela Forrest, will be kindly compiling these and we'll be reserving some time toward the end of the discussion to cover your questions and your comments. So without further ado, let's get started on our panel discussion. Uh, Johannes, I'm going to start with you, and I'm going to ask you to discuss a few uh, measurement related issues, if you will. Can you start by, you know, perhaps sharing some of your observations on what we mean by measurement when it comes to anti-corruption? How reliable are existing anti-corruption indicator sets? And are they really telling us the full story about changes in the anti-corruption space? What are we missing? Over to you, Johannes. Well, thank you, Janine. Um, fantastic to be here this morning with you and Sky, and very pleased that some of what I will be talking about can really usefully build on much of what has been said over the past few days. Now, before I speak to the utility of global level indicators, here's a general but very important point that I want to highlight first. When we talk about measurement, evidence, and learning, we have to be crystal clear about our objective. What is it that we're trying to learn, and for what reason? Who is this learning for? What is the key problem we're grappling with and are trying to solve for? With specificity and purpose, uh, we, we get there, but it is important that we're clear. In my mind, the core objective that we should all pursue when thinking about measurement, evidence, and learning is to figure out how we, all of us working in the anti-corruption field, can design and implement more effective anti-corruption interventions. And we need to do that because despite all the progress we have made over the past 20 years, there remains much to do. Doing that has been the driving force for much of our work at Global Integrity, whether through the production of governance indicators, our anti-corruption evidence program, or other systems work we've been doing. Two great examples from the past two days that I thought were spot on in terms of colleagues being clear about their objective was Alina arguing why she created the IPI and Shilpa Golnu sharing the corruption specific learning question. Having that specific question and being clear about our intentions as to how we want to use our findings is absolutely key for any of us to learn effectively. Now, to your question, we can group, uh, we can group existing evidence and measurements into three categories, categories that can and will certainly overlap at times. First, we have a number of measures, often indices, that help us describe and count instances of corruption or the institutional safeguards that we believe can help counter corruption. This is important and good information, especially because, especially because uh, we have some initial entry points to understanding a little bit of the context from the outside. We have many examples of these sorts of measures, and obviously you know most of them or many of them, expert assessments, perception and experience indices, administrative data, integrity indicators, from anyone from Freedom House to the OECD, uh, to our own Africa integrity indicators, the T index, control of corruption, amongst many, many others. But, and that is important to stress right away, all these measures show correlation only, association of variables. And none of this is ever about causality. A second type of evidence is all the work that helps us learn about the drivers of corruption, studies that can help us understand the causes of corruption and provide insights on whether, how, and why corruption evolves. A good example of this is the study Cheyenne presented a few days back about investigating social norms as a driver of corruption in Uganda 
and the Democratic Republic of Congo. But there are other studies and many different approaches as Brigitte Zeim laid out a few days back. This evidence serves as, mu as a much needed bedrock for our theories of change about what drives corruption and how change can happen. Evidence that hypothesizes first and then investigates causal relationships. And a third category of evidence is all the data that can help us generate actionable evidence about our own role in fostering and catalyzing change. This sort of evidence focuses on asking whether and to what extent our interventions can impact how change happens in the world. As an example, in the ACE program I'm running with Paul Haywood, we're just now evaluating whether and how our internal theory of change has contributed to the outcomes we have observed. Now, when doing our anti-corruption work, when assessing evidence, it is crucial that we find the right mix between these three types of evidence and measurements. It is not good enough for us to throw around quantitative indicators without an explicit theory of change about how change happens nor is it sufficient to have a general theory of change about how the world might work without ever checking whether our own programs do actually help in fostering and catalyzing any positive change. Now, I know that you asked me to specifically say why and how global level indicators miss telling the full story, or in my framing, how they do very little, at least on their own, to really help us design more effective anti-corruption interventions. There has been a rich discussion about this over the past decade, about the utility of global level indicators and their shortcomings. I can't recap the entire debate, but, but what I can do at this point is to point out a few select reasons for why some of these prominent indicators are of limited value. And I can highlight a few instances in which indicator or data comparison projects were developed to precisely counter some of these shortcomings in that first generation of anti-corruption indicators. One critique is that global level indicators often mirror Western modernization thinking instead of engaging with and highlighting priorities as they exist in a given country. And that is often true. Two good examples of index projects that have addressed this challenge are the USAID Good Governance Barometer from 2015 tested in Senegal and the Everyday Peace Indicators Project by Pamina Filco and Roger McGinty. Both of these indicators build the ind indicators bottom up stick to rigorous data collection processes and then return external validity. Another critique is that global level indices are not specific enough to help identify entry points to concrete reform in specific sectors or localities, and that they too often bundle different dimensions of corruption that require further unpacking. Thus, the critique goes, there is a lack of actionability. And again, fully agreed with that critique. Two good examples that make inroads towards addressing these critiques, but that don't entirely offset other challenges inherent to indicator measurement are the Unbundling Corruption Index by Yuan Yuaneng, in which she unpacks four different types of corruption in 15 countries, or the uh, OECD Public Integrity Indicators that Jesper Johnson has spearheaded over the past two to three years at, at the OECD. Yet another critique has been that indices measure institutional frameworks but do not capture realities on the ground. Again, preventing change agents or stakeholders from identifying what the useful entry points are for taking action. Again, fully agreed with that critique. Three good examples that have made progress in dealing with this critique are implementation gap focused measures as they were developed by us some 15 years ago, the IPI Alina introduced on Tuesday and recent work by the Natural Resource Governance Institute on the Resource Governance Index. Just to emphasize one more time, none of these indicators on their own are useful for us to either truly understand the causal roots for why and how corruption persists and how change happens, nor do they tell us anything about the effectiveness of our own actions. For us to effectively learn, we must specify a clear objective of our efforts and then combine different data sources and right size the use of these sources to really help us address the key problem we're trying to solve for. But let me stop here, back over to you, Janine. So Johannes, you've already started getting into this, um, but I, I wanna check it to see if there are any other sort of um, to, to respond to some of those challenges that you highlighted, um, any other good tools or emerging practices that, that you found that have, that have helped us to make this connection between some of the theories of change that are maybe embedded in, in the way we're approaching our work and, and how we're actually measuring progress? Yeah, that is a good question. And um, so I should say to me, it is very clear that we need to make additional progress on this front, on measuring the effectiveness of anti-corruption interventions. But it is also clear that that progress needs to primarily start with the program design itself and the interventions we set out to test. Design needs to be much more experimental than it often is and at times bold. 
we need to be comfortable to approach anti-corruption tests really with a beginner's mindset through which we discover problems and then unlock solutions jointly with local actors who are affected or close to the problem. Instead of coming at the, at the issue with preconceived external solutions for which measurement is really just a checkmark exercise. When there are promising interventions, we cannot be satisfied with a simple assessment, has it worked? Any evidence we generate should always be able to explain why and how a particular pathway of change was chosen and how different actions by us or others have come together and resulted in change. Which is why I prefer to always say what works, why and how, and just make that a package, what works, why and how. In other words, we need to broaden our thinking and go beyond our comfort zone of technical interventions and linear change and output accounting, and instead embrace uncertainty and bring complexity and test systems thinking in. That is the way we learn and develop the field. Doing that means we're starting to really find out about which factors underpin effective anti-corruption work. I know this is way more easily said than done. So let me suggest as a starting point, a few examples of where we might all look for inspiration as to what exciting and promising interventions could look like, or start with, and then uh, result in us trying new anti-corruption interventions. In terms of the exploration and di the diagnosis of root causes for corruption, I suggest checking out the corruption functionality framework Heather Marquette and Karen Piper have put together and engage with that. I also think that there is value in revisiting Mushtaq Khan's political settlement approach that puts power and strategies to deal with power at the core of our anti-programming in sectors. I've already mentioned Cheyenne's social norms work utilizing a key systems thinking methodology and should also mention Claudia Baez Camargo's work on networks and informality as entry points to locating the mechanisms for why corruption persists. In terms of taking intentional and sector specific action that accounts for the insights and priorities by those at the front line of sectors, I recommend engaging with Curbing Corruption, a platform run by Mark Pyman and Paul Haywood. In terms of navigating politically challenging waters, I recommend paying close attention to the Publish What You Pay Network and the way it is managing political uncertainty by empowering their members with a healthy dose of freedom and yet support, which links very closely to anti-corruption support strategies that are suggested by Flora Gertzovich, Dave Algos, and Soledad Gatoni, that focuses on work and what we could be doing more of to strengthen social movements and other actors before, during, and after windows of opportunity. The Accountability Lab has recently highlighted how translocal networks, independent sets of grassroots actors, might be able to influence and shift norms, including anti-corruption, because of a shared identity. Much more to explore on this with Cherry, who will speak in a few minutes. There's much more to say and think through, including on questions of how to fold TWP and PEA into this question. And I should say that the way that USAID is already using PEA in very useful ways to, her, to learn and adapt and make programs better is a very promising and a leading approach in this field. I'll end here and should say that upon review, I realized I did reference quite a few things now, and I'll produce a handout with notes to links of many of the cases I've mentioned uh, for people to look that over at a later point in time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johannes. And we will have a chance to share some of those additional resources um, through uh, a follow-up communication we'll have with all the participants. Um, so, so keep an eye out for that in your inbox to come in the next uh, few weeks. Um, but, but now I want to build off this discussion of measurement um, that we've had to, to get a sense about how we can really evaluate our impact in this fight against corruption. And, and for that, we're lucky to have Shara and, and Paolo with us. And, and I know the two of you have used really different approaches to evaluating the impact of our anti-corruption work. Um, so perhaps each of you can start with a short discussion of the activities that you've been evaluating and the approaches that you've been using for evaluation. Um, so perhaps we, we can um, go ahead and start with Sherry here and then we'll go to Paula. Thank you so much Janine and, and Sky for having me and Johannes, you laid a very good foundation for a fruitful conversation here. Um, I have to start by saying that the accountability lab works with an underpinning um, value of focusing on positive deviance. And so as such, amongst across a plethora of different interventions we implement, we always focus on highlighting what is working and building capacity and networks around that. 
um, and, and also amplifying positive messages to shift the narrative in, in countries with endemic corruption. I want to frame this conversation this way because this deeply impacts the way in which we have to measure what we're doing and the type of program participants we are working with. My first really important um, learning in terms of trying to measure our impact at the accountability lab over the last couple of years is that in measuring um, anti-corruption intervention outcomes, there's this tension around attribution and contribution. And this is very relevant to our work because especially when you are working with people within a corrupt civil service who are trying to do the right thing, which is often what we do, building capacity around integrity icons and civil servants who are already pushing for reforms. How many of that can you really attribute um, to us, our organization and our specific um, intervention? Because at the end of the day, you are working with people who have bought in fully and have been um, living the value of doing the right thing in a um, within a corrupt system. So in 2019, we launched a pretty rigorous contribution tracing study um, on our Integrity Icon program in Liberia. A little bit of background. In Integrity Icon, we essentially name and fame honest civil servants um, who are doing the right thing and going above and beyond to serve their communities. They come from a variety of civil service sectors and they are nominated by the community and so we cut out that sort of barrier of having um, people being honored who are so entrenched in a corrupt system and are therefore being honored for the wrong reasons. So the, these um, bottom up nominations then get sifted and we highlight five people each year across 12 different countries who are doing amazing work in a corrupt system. Now, again, measuring that is incredibly hard because these are people who are already doing the right thing. But the support network and the capacity building we, um, we do around them has led us to believe that it is having an impact and motivating them to do even more. And so undertaking this contribution tracing study really helped us to dive into that. I wonder if the production team could please pull up my slide, if you wouldn't mind. Essentially, um, while we wait for that, maybe it's just the... This might be Polas, if we can just move a couple along a little bit. This is it. I just wanted to place a summary slide of what a contribution um, tracing mechanism looks like for those of you who have not necessarily used it in the past. We essentially started by un unpacking the entire causal chain for this program all the way from launching the program to identifying these integrity icons who we will highlight name and fame, all the way through to having identified a change that they made in their civil service unit, so that we are able to, at every piece of this, breaking this up into 11 different portions, see where our intervention directly made a contribution to their effectiveness around change in their civil service unit. I just wanted to, to um, pull this up so that you can see that we've learned that measuring contribution means really breaking things down into smaller bits, especially when we are working with people who are doing the right things. This helped us see that we have um, one or two places in this causal chain where we really make a difference. The most important finding being that really celebrating people doing the right thing and doing that very publicly increases the motivation level of those reformers to push for good governance practices in their um, civil service agency. So that was a finding across the board. Um, and secondly, and, and attached to this, we saw that there was greater recognition after they were named and famed from others within their unit. So a great story here is when I went to do some interviews at the um, at a police station in Liberia to, to work on this, um, this study, I walked in and I asked for someone who is our integrity icon. And the person at the reception desk said to me immediately, oh, you're from the accountability lab. 
I want to be an integrity icon next year. And so this hype that we create doesn't only motivate the, the single person, but creates motivation around. And we continue to measure that on an ongoing basis, which I'll speak to in some of my later points. You're welcome to take down the slide, thank you. The second point I want to make about our work on, on positive deviant is that we found that working in a translocal network, as Johannes pointed out earlier, means that we are trying to implement similar but deeply localized and contextualized programming across 12 different countries at the moment. This requires rigorous learning in different places and, and this learning looks differently. But also related to that, it means that working in different spaces does not mean that you can transplant your indicators from one place to another because progress looks differently in different places. And this is actually a big investment of time and something that I think can be taken for granted in the measurement space. We often um, start a program in one country as an experiment, as a pilot, and we see that there could be fruitful soil for a similar intervention in another space, but we always pause to do a contextual map to better understand what does this indicator mean here? What should the targets for this be? And a couple of good examples to just make this clear is, for example, indicators around gender participation and indicators around collaboration. In some spaces where there's um, a less deep gender divide or where, they, um, where collaboration is, um, is more likely to be expected because the social, um, social cohesion challenge isn't as big as in other places, you can expect to see faster turnover in terms of bringing women, young people, diversity of participants into programs. And similarly, um, you can expect to see greater collaboration when there aren't these entrenched rifts between communities. However, in places with closing civic space and with deep gender divides, we have to think about these things differently. And so we've done a whole lot of work around ensuring that our indicators are contextually relevant. A story about that is how our USAID funded program in Zimbabwe um, is seeing a real increase in participation in some of our community town hall meetings around critical issues where we, um, we weren't sure to what extent we were able were going to be able to get locally elected officials into communities that are deeply divided into two camps politically. Um, and that was an indicator we set out to track, um, knowing that we may actually not do that well on that one just based on the political context. However, um, we've been wonderfully surprised at the different mechanisms we were able to leverage to be able to measure impact there, especially leveraging upcoming elections. But that type of indicator would be way less relevant in a place like Nepal, for example. Um, and again, like this is an indicator we then um, added specifically for Zimbabwe because we knew that that would show change in that arena. The last point I want to make quickly is that measuring at the outcomes level takes a whole lot of time. All of us work on interventions that have no quick fixes. Measuring how a reformer based on capacity building pushes for a good governance change in his agency might take years, but our program cycle might be one year. And so we've had to invest a whole lot of time, resources, and really thoughtful program design beyond the program cycle to be able to measure that type of change. Looping back quickly to the integrity icon process I referenced, there we've had to create alumni groups, we, we allocate staff time to do quarterly um, or biannual learning calls with each of these icons to hear what they're doing, how what they're doing is influenced by accountability labs interventions, how they are collaborating with others and building a network for positive change, which is what we set out to do, but that's impossible to measure within a year. And I think this is something that we not only have to entrench at the implementer level, but also at the donor level, that recognition that if we say we are committed to um, positive outcomes within the anti-corruption space, we have to truly invest in measuring way beyond the project cycle to be able to do so. 
Thank you so much, Janine. I'll hand back over to you. Thank you so much, Sherry, for that, that really rich set of approaches and tools that you, you're all working with and experimenting with at Integrity Lab. Um, so now we're going to turn to Paula to share a bit about what USAID uh, Ukraine has been doing in the health sector. So over to you, Paula. Thank you, Janine. And, and uh, taking over from Sherry, I was really impressed with the experience she shared. But let's uh, zoom in now to a very specific sector, health sector. And I'm glad to share with you the lessons we in USA and Ukraine learned quite recently in evaluating the anti-corruption aspects of our health reform and health system strengthening activity. See, we, we have a health reform support, which is a USAID five-year activity with a budget of, kind of slightly more than $37 million, helping Ukraine to build a transparent and accountable healthcare system and reduce informal out-of-pocket payments while improving access to the quality services. Mitigating of systemic corruption across the health system is an overarching aim of this activity and is to be achieved through the five key objectives, uh, improving health sector governance, transforming healthcare financing, strengthening the health workforce, enhancing transparency and accountability of the healthcare system via digital health tools, and finally, improving service delivery systems. As you can hear, the HRS scope is so broad, covering almost all six WHO health system building blocks, except procurement, of course. And it was deliberately designed to be like that, because when we were designing the activity, we had to be very flexible, as there was no certainty that the major health reform law would really through the reform opposed parliament. But luckily, this kind of law did go through, and um, not least due to the extensive USAID and other donors' support to the reformers in the Ministry of Health and to the civil society activists. So the HRS activity started with the very launch of health reform in Ukraine in the spring of 2018, and now is in its fourth year of implementation. Last summer, we had an external kind of performance evaluation of HRS, and in planning it, we wanted to concentrate on limited key HRS co components, which in theory will have the most impact on corruption, and these are health governance, financing, and transparency. We use traditional approach of using mixed methods, quantitative and qualitative data collection and analysis, including key informant interviews, focus group discussions, and online surveys with health administrators, healthcare workers, and patients to get answers to the kind of three very straightforward questions. To what extent we contributed to health reform uh, aimed at kind of better governance, better governance, can go better transparency and financing, what our interventions are most relevant and effective, and what are the lessons for uh, the USAID programs in reducing corruption in the health sector. So the key findings of this evaluation were that our activity HRS really significantly contributed to the improved governance, transformed financing and enhanced transparency of healthcare through kind of being the major technical assistance provider in the country, both at the reform development and implementation stages. And it was demonstrated by clear and objectively observed milestones or markers, if you like, most of them had zero as a baseline three years ago. So before 2018, Ukraine has decades of non-transparent way of funding healthcare providers. It goes, the money went from the Central Ministry of Health to the regional government authorities, then to the local district authorities and municipalities, and only then at last, healthcare providers. And at each stage of this chain, corruption, abuse or misuse of funds could happen or did happen hidden from the public eyes. So now a single purchasing agency of healthcare, National Health Service of Ukraine or NHSU in short, 
directly contracts and pays 95% of all healthcare facilities, which became uh, public enterprises, independent from the Ministry of Health and independent from the central government at all. And annually, it pays around $5 billion to all these healthcare providers and does it exclusively uh, via digital and health very visible to e-health. Can you show the, the first slide you know, that, uh, yeah, my apologies, it's in Ukrainian, but it's uh, very visible. So in this slide, this is one of the NHSU live dashboards living on its public website. And in this slide, it shows the primary healthcare providers contracted by the service in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, and you can see on the map with addresses of all the clinics, all the centers with phone numbers, um, each family doctors, these places have, how, even how many patients each of these doctors already signed up the declaration with and the, showing the, whether they reached the limits of patients uh, they have, if, if you look at the right-hand column in the green. If you go to the next slide, so the next slide shows you that nationally more than 32 million people is uh, or 85% of Ukrainian population have chosen their family doctor. And this is kind of can be seen in the left upper section. And with the key statistics like gender and sex of the patients with the kind of this top left circle and like you can see that women prevail over men by about 5%. Then we can see urban and rural divide underneath this circle. We have ages graph, the kind of ages of the patients, and we have regional split of the patients across all the 25 regions of Ukraine on the right. You can now kind of <clears throat> take down the slide and we will return to presentation. So both the National Health Service of Ukraine and e-house were established and developed with significant USAID and HRS support. Without them, it, it would really be impossible. Another very tangible outcome of the new financing mechanisms, which you know, were supported by HRS, was significantly increased salaries of primary health care workers. But when we look at this, you know, however kind of big these achievements, we still see it as indirect kind of interim steps leading to reduced corruption in healthcare. And apart from very few universally accepted indicators, such as, for example, percentage of out-of-pocket payments in the total healthcare expenditure, or perceived level of corruption in, in health sector or experienced instances of corruption in healthcare. All of them are at a very high, very general level, very kind of resource consuming. They lack granularity, they lack dynamism, but we could not really find or identify more sensitive and nuanced indicators that can trace kind of more directly and objectively the impact of better governance, better financing, better transparency on corruption in healthcare that can be felt by each citizen, for example. And at the same time, that those indicators can be easily collectable and comparable across the countries or across the region. See, this kind of work is still ahead of us as we look forward to the new uh, stage of programming in the sector and uh, applying anti-corruption lens. Over to you, Kniva Janine and, and uh, the rest of the team are happy then to answer any questions that we may have. Great, Paula. Um, you know, thank you for being such a leader in, in really bringing anti-corruption work into the health sector. We, we think this is a really exciting and, um, and interesting emerging area, and, and we hope that, you know, some of the work that you are doing right now in Ukraine may help to, to inspire other missions who are thinking about engaging um, in these corruption issues in the health sector. Um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question uh, both to you, Sherry, and to you, Paula, about um, usage. So, so sometimes we have these really useful evaluations. They have 
really pertinent findings, but we really fail to incorporate those into our work. Um, and I'm curious, you know, it sounds like both of you have been very actively engaging with the data that's been produced out of your evaluation. And, and I wonder if you can share with us some good practices or examples about how you've ensured that those evaluations uh, improve your programming. So why don't we start again with Sherry and then we'll go back to Paula again. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Janine. That's a very good question. And of course, there's a variety of incentives to do an evaluation and it, it might just be part and parcel of, of a grant agreement, right? To be very honest, that we're meant to evaluate something. One thing that we're trying to do um, at the Accountability Lab is to really build a culture of learning um, so that people understand um, that are on our team that really learning from our evaluations and from our monitoring activities make all of us better at our job. I think again here, the fact that we operate in a translocal network that has um, a fully local team in every country where we work really helps because it means that the people who are both designing and implementing a particular program is deeply invested in positive outcomes in that particular context. They have deep community roots. Um, they themselves are in a way victims of a corrupt system in, in that country. And I think this is, serves as a very big emotive incentive to want to improve your own program delivery. But on a practical level, we have created systems in the lab like um, joint reflection sessions, internal learning sessions, um, and also being very open about failures and challenges through activities like fail fairs so that we normalize learning and, um, and signal from all different levels within the organization that it's okay to not get it right the first time, um, that we are all here to learn together and really synthesizing data and learnings across the different network labs so that we don't repeat the same sort of pitfalls in other places has been really useful for us in um, building this culture of learning. I will say that this isn't easy um, because people get in the habit of doing something a specific way. That is human nature, right? Um, but I think it is something that really needs to be built into underpinning values of the organization, and it needs to be modeled at all levels of the organization throughout. Great, thanks for that um, that response, Sherry. And, and I love this idea of you know cultivating a real culture of learning. I think that's so critical. And and I'm curious to learn more about these fail labs. It, that sounds like you know a very good way of making sure you had a structured uh, conversation around around these challenges. Um, over to you, Paolo, with with a few thoughts on this topic. Yeah, I can kind of look in now at the area of reducing corruption in the health sector. Uh, what we can really say that because of the myriad factors influencing uh, corruption related behavior, for example, of healthcare providers and healthcare users, and linked to a very fluid social and economic and political country context, it is impossible to identify reliable, robust, or relevant kind of metrics for an activity at the design stage and a procurement stage. Uh, because the implementation usually starts at best in one year and sometimes at one and a half or even two years since it's designed. So it's already outdated. So one thing that we might be doing and it would be useful is just to have like an inception period, like between six and nine months at the very beginning of the implementation of activity for the implementing partner jointly with USA, kind of technical people and monitoring people and key country stakeholders and partners really to develop the limited set of smart kind of key impact indicators that could uh, directly related uh, to um, activity interventions. That one of the some practical kind of uh, um, practical solution to the things we were discussing before. Over. Thanks, Paula. You know, I, I think that's a really great observation, and it, it points to the need to it's not just about to think about adaptability in our programming, not just think, build in opportunities for co-creation, how we design our programs, but that really needs to extend um, to monitoring, evaluation, and learning as well. So I, I think that's a really 
great um, observation and a, a thing that I think will apply to a lot of people. Um, we're going to quickly, um, in a moment, we're going to transition to our Q&A. Um, so I want to plug again our Q&A form. If everybody can go ahead and um, you know think about what you want to ask our panelists, I think that they've they've already um, shared a lot of really insightful comments. They've already uh, highlighted a number of tools we might want to dig into a bit more in Q&A. Um, so go ahead and, and click on that link and submit your question. You can either address it to all the panelists, you can ask a general question, or you can direct it to a specific panelist if you'd like. But before we move to that Q&A section, um, I'd like to do a, a kind of rapid fire fact round, um, a lightning round, where we ask each of you uh, to respond to um, a question. And sorry, I've just lost my place. So let me sure make sure I get this right. Um, based on what you've learned from measurement and evaluation in your work, in one minute or less, um, how might you advise USAID and other practitioners to better enable effective monitoring, evaluation, and learning? Um, so perhaps we'll start with Paula for this round and then go to, to Sherry and then Johannes. Yep. I think I've already mentioned kind of in my kind of uh, remark about this uh, need to be kind of flexible and really kind of allow this flexibility at the very implementation. Uh, so you can, kind of, I would really <clears throat> uh, look also at another aspect. We often overlook more long term perspective in the country specific context when we were evaluating the activity outcomes. Because very often it is kind of it's there, this kind of long-term perspective and long-term horizon and specific country context that often makes the, the progress or breakthrough possible. For example, if, if I can apply kind of my country, it's due to the Ukraine revolution of dignity of 2013 and 14 and very strong civil society, uh, which can into which kind of all the donors were investing since mid nineties, it's really the open window of opportunity to fight corruption across all spheres of life in Ukraine and especially in health sector in 2017, 19, four years since things have happened. And this window opportunity is, is still there, but it is closing. But without this, it would be not really possible to really evaluate the impact of, of our interventions. Over. Thanks so much, Paula. I think um, being able to detect having those adaptable monitoring evaluation uh, mechanisms that help us to do that early detection of windows of opportunity, like you, like you just said, it it helps us to be better placed to, to react quickly um, before those windows close. Um, over to you, Sherry. Thanks, Janine. Yes, I think for me, if I had one minute or less, the, the biggest thing would be to apply adaptive learning in creating MAL plans. Often we are creating a MAL plan for a specific project before we've done any sort of um, baseline study or built any sort of contextual map for that space. And then we sort of beholden the indicators that three months into the project are not exactly what we thought they would be. This is also specifically relevant when we're working either in a new context or in a context where we're working with new implementing partners that form a core part of our ability to deliver an intervention. So I think at different spaces in um, our implementation, it would be key to actually go back and say, this is what we agreed upon as a MAL plan for this five-year project. But actually now that we are three months in and we have this data um, and also unexpected findings at the, from the startup of the project, how do we go back and like thoughtfully adjust the indicators we set out to measure in the beginning? and also um, adjust our measuring methods because what we thought we would be able to deliver might become an unreasonable expectation um, very early on. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. I think that adaptability uh, is, is certainly really critical. Um, and now we're gonna to transition to Johannes. Um, the, the last one minute block is for you. Great. Um, so from a from a global integrity perspective, we've grappled with this question quite a bit. And uh, I think our key insight is that it does not make sense to separate MEL as being an, a secondary, right? A second aspect to any program. So we have really started to construct programs 
as cycles of action and learning in, in a way that MEL and anything on understanding the problem, mapping the problem, planning for actions and taking actions, reflecting on those actions, that that is really part of the program cycle itself. And I think that is the key to really ensuring that we don't think of learning as an add-on activity where, you know, at some point somebody gets a report, but as something that we do live and breathe throughout every program cycle that we complete. I know that uh, USAID and also some other larger development organizations have experimented with this as well. I should say I've never really done a CLL, CLA cycle, but my understanding and having gone through the materials a number of times and listened to some presentations is that there is excellent an excellent knowledge base and lots of advice already about how to really think about in this in, in this um, in this instance collaboration, learning, and adaptation within USAID. But happy, happy to talk more about that and you know really apply to specifics if that was useful. Thanks very much. And I think all of your comments really um, set us up to, to raise some really interesting questions and points in the question and answer. So I, I'm glad to see that we've got about 20 minutes or so for the question and answer period. If you haven't submitted your questions yet, please go ahead and do that now. And I'm gonna turn the floor back over to Sky um, to help moderate the Q&A portion. So, so Sky, over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Janine, and, and thanks to all of our panelists for um, just your, your very insightful uh, comments on such a, a challenging um, issue. Um, so uh, just as we wait for the questions to kind of finish coming in, I wanted to start off uh, with a question for um, all panelists, uh, but we'll start with Johannes, and, and if um, you want to take it, great, and if not, um, we, we do have questions coming in. Uh, so, you know, we've covered evidence learning in a number of different areas um, on, uh, you know, day two of evidence learning week and, and even this morning, including kind of institutional approaches, non-governmental actors, social norms and SBC, strategic corruption, cross-sectoral approaches, um, you know, really kind of covered so many different areas. I'm so wondering if you could share some advice on measurement and evaluation in one or more of these areas. Uh, feel free to kind of touch on, on whatever you see as most appropriate. Um, Johannes, over to you. Great, well, thank you. I'll make two, two just quick points. One is, um, again, building on what Cheyenne herself uh, said in her presentation on social norms. There are aspects of our programming, of our anti-corruption programming, where we're really starting from a base that is not very developed. There is not a lot of evidence about how MEL can work when it comes to, for example, social norms measuring. And I think in those instances, it is really critical that we all have right size our expectations to be really curious and to, to really invest curiosity in figuring out what all this means and try things. There are other aspects, and I'll, I'll give you an example, where we have long established insights about what we might do on corruption in health or in procurement. And as Global Integrity, we're currently working on a project um, across a number of countries with with uh, development actors, local actors on the ground who precisely have prioritized making progress on a particular health question. And in those instances, I think it becomes much more of a question of really strategically finding uh, ways of integrating MEL throughout a particular, throughout a particular uh, project cycle, starting with the problems that they have clearly defined already and investigating what is the, what is the problem that they, they are currently focusing on and what are our MEL measures, whether it is indicators, data points, uh, causal evidence that we need to bring, or reflection and learning sessions, uh, pause and reflect sessions, to really investigate whether the, the actions they are taking are spot on with what seems useful and usable, and doing that in a way that is really uh, based and building on the priorities that those actors have at that moment in time. So those are just two aspects I think worth keeping in mind. Thanks, Johannes. It's really great to, to highlight both kind of the emerging areas and then um, ways we can incorporate existing um, indicators. Um, Sherry or uh, Paula, maybe Sher Sherry first. Um, do you have anything you want to say on this question? I think Johannes captured a lot of the key points already, Sky. I, I just want to emphasize again the, the idea of right-sizing expectations and also um, the importance of partnership building, because if we are working across a variety of types of actors, non-governmental um, people within the, in the government, which we do at Accountability Lab through building insider-outsider networks to push for reforms, 
it means that you actually have to invest in that relationship building throughout the project cycle so that you are able to get the data you need to be able to measure the intervention. And I think this is a, um, this is a key point that often gets taken for granted. So how do you bring every actor into the program design and into the understanding of the importance of the MUL component of a project so that they are also deeply invested in helping you measure your impact throughout and specifically at the end of an intervention. Thanks, Sherry. That's a great point. I think particularly when we're dealing with data, we can forget that it's really important to engage with humans um, and, and make sure that that data is informed and, and you really kind of linked throughout the, the whole process. Um, so that's a great point. Um, Paula, anything you want to uh, jump in on this point? No, I have no nothing to add. It's a lot of things were said already. Useful. Great, thanks. Thanks, Paula. Okay, um, let's let's go to a, a question that we've got from the audience uh, for Sherry, um, and it's a two-parter. Sherry, I'll raise kind of both questions uh, for you, and then if you need me to uh, raise the second question after you've done the first, um, let me know. Um, so uh, we got a question around um, the evidence on on naming and faming having an impact. Um, so what evidence exists, and and what might be. Um, some unintended consequences I and mean, related to that, you know, has there been any kind of backlash towards champions um, as they can be perceived as going against the status quo? Yeah, thank you. That is a really good question. Um, and in many ways, one question, because in, in sort of trying to measure the impact of naming and faming, you do come across both positives and unfortunately, um, some negatives. So I'll try not to take too much time. In terms of naming and faming, I think we rely heavily on sort of our own data, which, as I explained, is in, um, in two ways we collect that. Firstly, we've, we've done this contribution tracing study to go really deeply into the specific factors of a naming and faming approach that um, not only motivate civil servants, but lead to them actively pushing for reforms. And so in that sense, we've been able to highlight the pieces of our intervention that, that do make a difference. I think for me, one of the, um, the pieces of, um, of evidence that's most salient is that we've seen how with it, by using naming and faming, we've been able to um, to shift the narratives within certain civil society um, departments. And that we've seen that in a, in a range of different ways. First, I'd like to highlight that we've seen superiors or power holders at a much higher level than the civil servants we work with recognize that, hey, this um, celebrating this person is actually bringing really positive attention to my unit. So how can I help this person build forward? That, of course, with the caveat relying on um, relying on that the, the higher ups need to be invested in integrity too, right? Which we know isn't always the case. So I just want to frame it that way. Um, this has led to us seeing people, for example, as a result of participating in our programming, being looped into ethics processes that, that then give them the potential to really influence agency-wide or even national processes. We've also seen a fundamentally good approach on um, outcome with regards to how we've been able to shift the narrative on gender. For example, in deeply patriarchal countries, naming and faming women as champions of integrity within the civil service have led us to see an increase in the number of women not only applying, but um, sort of working their way up within the civil service. A good example of this is within Pakistan um, in the Balochistan region, which is deeply patriarchal, where we have firsthand sort of evidence of naming and faming a woman, leading to an increase in women through role model creation. So these are the, this is the type of evidence we've gathered around the positive impact of it. However, there are of course, um, negative impacts as well. And, and thankfully so far, the positive has outweighed the negative for us in our findings. So when we do these quarterly learning calls or biannual learning calls with our integrity icons, we also ask them specifically, not just what has changed positively in your work environment, but what has changed um, negatively as well. Are you facing any adverse challenges um, as a result of your participation? In some cases, there's obviously some underlying jealousy amongst, um, amongst colleagues. We've also 
experienced somewhat that people can potentially, um, in very few cases we've seen that, be blocked from working their way up within the civil service and, and that heavily relies again or sort of is heavily tied to whoever the power holders are in that in that unit and to what extent they are bought into or not bought into the idea of integrity and good governance. Um, and I think, of course, the most obvious one that we've seen is that you can really be ostracized within this a corrupt civil service for being the good actor. You may not be serving in the best interest of the, the bigger group or the majority of the group, right? But one way in which we are working against that tide of, of ostracism is by creating a network of integrity icons. So we are not just honoring you as an individual, but we are connecting you to a cohort of people and an alumni group of people in your country who are like-minded, who are um, who share your values and who are also pushing for reforms. And we've heard over and over again that this makes a massive difference, sort of like widening that island of integrity so that people feel supported because often isolation comes um, goes hand in hand with being an actor of integrity within a corrupt system. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sherry. Um, let's move on to a question that we have uh, from um, a participant um, that kind of builds off a, a point that Sherry mentioned on thinking beyond the, the project cycle. Um, question for you, Paula, from your, your mission perspective, um, how have you approached the balance between the need to measure um, long term and the limited availability of funds to invest in kind of longitudinal measurement uh, for implementing partners? Curious if you could weigh in on that. Thank you. That's a great, a great question. Um, I think uh, we, we had a, a, a whole series of interventions in health, and it's not that we starting from zero. And for example, the activity I was talking about, you know, uh, yeah, that's the first phase of the reform, but, but we are currently looking in and, and uh, designing already the second stage of support. And kind of by designing kind of for the next stage, we already are taking into account the evaluation, the performance evaluation that we've just recently had, kind of put it in, in our, as, as the kind of learning things and all the materials to all the uh, potential and prospective bidders for the next stage. And uh, but we will be a bit better also kind of learning um, about the existing or <clears throat> indicators in the sector or metrics that probably some other countries will be using. So learning from other countries in the USA. So we, we are learning, yes. And we would definitely kind of that's uh, um, also kind of learning about the, the uh, importance of having this kind of long-term perspective and, and looking not only kind of like kind of two years or three years before we started the project or looking only at the baseline, but also having more kind of longer term perspective, both backwards and probably forwards, you know, when we will be um, uh, implementing the second stage of, of the reform. Um, but it's, it's a difficult question really to answer. <laughs> Over. It is indeed, but but a, a great answer. Um, you know, really um, good to highlight how we've we've tr you've really tried to take learning um, and and use it um, uh, really to 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 get kind of our heads around uh, this issue. Um, question for for Johannes and then and then Paula as well, if if you want to to weigh in. Um, given that it's uh, related to, to health. Um, so we've got a question from the audience on how you link progress on anti-corruption indicators and improvement to performance um, and, and health outcomes. Um, and, and you know, can you define if the improvement in the performance is due to the reduction in corruption or um, for other reasons? Um, so let's start with uh, Johannes and then, and then we can uh, move to Paula. Great, thank you. Um, good question, great question and, and key question. I mean, that is what we have to figure out. Um, I fear my last answer was a bit garbled because ideally I would have already addressed that in my in my last answer um, a bit clearer, I, I think. There are various ways to think about the types of corruption, the, um, the ways in which corruption affects health outcomes. 
And it is very tricky for us to sit here in front of our screens and to make informed statements about what sort of corrupt activity is linked to what sort of health outcome. We, we can, of course, write papers, and we oftentimes do that, and then say, look, you know, we, we've taken, uh, we've taken a view of, of five or six different health projects, and we have found that what matters in those projects are these health outcomes, and these were the related uh, corruption questions that we needed to grapple with. But more useful than that, sitting in front of our computers and hypothesizing, is, I think, really going to the field to a particular location where there are specific health issues at stake, and then sitting down and identifying with those actors on the ground, what is the key health outcome that you prioritize at this moment in time, hopefully for the next two or three years, and triangulate what that, what that issue is, what the priority is. And starting with that health outcome to then work backwards and say, let's take a look at whether any, of, any instances of corruption are really impeding that particular health outcome from happening, to then set the indicators that we need to make progress on both as regards health outcomes and as regards instances of corruption that might prevent those outcomes. And that, in essence, is again a way of doing systems thinking, involving those who are really at the, at the front of particular service delivery issues that need to be tackled, that we all want to tackle, but taking our time to do that well through cycles of identifying problems jointly with those local stakeholders and then figuring out whether there is anything and, and what it is that we can do in order to uh, tackle challenges, obstacles in the way to get to those health outcomes. So in, in short, there, there is not a generic answer that I would feel comfortable giving here, although we can, and I can certainly point you to papers that make, uh, you know, that, that talk about health outcomes and some corruption instances and how one might make progress on both. But I think the key thing for us to remember and to really, to really prioritize ourselves is to start with the problems as they're experienced by local actors and then work backward to identify corruption instances and what we might do against those. Thanks, thanks, Johan. It's really kind of highlighting a theme that we've had throughout, obviously, which is the importance of, of context. And and Paula, you know, in your work with Ukraine, I think you're you're demonstrating that importance of really digging in. So I just wanted to give you a chance to to jump in on this question if you had anything else you wanted to add. Yeah, I think and I'm a very practical person, kind of being a project project manager, kind of, and yes, I kind of understand and deal with evaluation, but kind of more kind of uh, really looking at the kind of design and implementation. And um, when we when we look at anti-corruption in health sector, we are trying to understand all kind of different because there's different ways and different forms, kind of petty corruption, gross corruption, corruption in procurement. What we identified kind of and people identified for themselves as the biggest issue for them as corruption in house is the need to pay. Um, money for the things that are provided by the state free. And that's why for us, this manifestation is in informal payments. So what we are trying just to understand and link is how through, for example, better transparency of all the transactions and kind of then um, all kind of the other kind of things like better governance in healthcare, uh, how we can reduce these informal payments. How, for example, through better financing, we were able just to increase salaries of healthcare providers so that they don't have the kind of motivation or kind of less motivation to ask for for bribes and for informal payments from, from the patients. So for us, it's very concrete things, but so, sometimes we need just to be kind of to standardize probably this and be more specific and, and compare these things with, with the other countries, for example, who might have similar situation and agree, okay, oh, this is the standard link. This is how we can measure. So we are grappling with, we are trying just to feel it. We are feeling it, but we are not yet at the stage where it can, can be very kind of concrete. Okay, this kind of links to this and this links just to kind of to less informal payments. And again, this is just one aspect because corruption is so varied and corruption in the house also can be varied. The other impersonification of corruption is, uh, for example, nepotism in, uh, um, um, in uh, um, 
giving places of job for um, uh, for new doctors or, or new personnel. And, and we are very often still is a problem in, in the secondary in the secondary care in the hospitals where kind of corruption is still very much entrenched and, and not yet kind of uh, have a lot of impact on this. In primary care, yes, a lot of progress. In secondary, no. See, we, we are still grappling with these issues, but that's a great question. That's why we're working in these programs. Over to you. Thanks, Paula. Um, okay, I think we have time for just one more question and then we'll turn to our, our quick wrap up. Um, so a question for, for Sherry um, that uh, kind of is, is a drawing on a couple of questions that we've gotten from the, the audience. Um, would working more with, with local and, and grassroots partners on monitoring evaluation of anti-corruption programming lead to a more nuanced and contextually appropriate understanding of corruption dynamics? If so, um, how? You know, we've touched on this. So, so um, yeah, I think you can kind of build that on, on what we've already discussed, but over to you, Sherry, to, to close us out. Absolutely, a thousand percent, Sky. Um, we, we have to start working with local partners, not just on implementing, but also on monitoring and evaluation. And the, the nuance is so important. I'll, I'll share a quick story. My first year of working at the Accountability Lab, I created this actually for the contribution tracing study. It's really cool, like interview protocol. I'm ready. I'm on the plane to Liberia. And one of my first questions um, that I ask of a participant is, um, what kind of support have you gotten from the accountability lab beyond the, you know, beyond the program? And the answer is a solid no, I've gotten no support from the accountability lab. And my colleague goes to me and says, like, support translates into money here. And so something as simple as just uh, the wording we choose when we create evaluation questions, um, when we would go deeper into things like interviews and surveys and so on makes a difference. And you would not be able to know that from BC or wherever that those things are contextual and we have to work with local partners. And the one other thing I think is really important to say here is that I think this is also an equity issue. Like there's a lot of hubris in thinking that we can, can go from the global north and, and, and just go and, and measure impact in the global south without really deep rooted understanding of, of not just our own programs and impact, but also on why particular things matter more than others. And there are experts all over the world. And I think we should make it also part of our equity values to really start recognizing and um, building that sort of um, support, sorry, support for local and indigenous knowledge. Thanks, Sherry. That was a, a great note to close on, really highlighting the importance of equity partnership, um, and again, kind of the 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 essential role of of um, humans in, in this in this process, um, and and really getting Emily right. So, uh, thank you all for for engaging on on such rich questions. Thanks to the audience for for your um, great questions, and Janine, over to you to close out our session. Oh, you're muted. Thanks so much, Sky, and, and my really sincere thanks to all of our excellent panelists. You've shared some really thoughtful and practical observations about how we can improve both our, our approaches to measuring corruption itself and to measuring and assessing our, our progress in combating corruption. And, and a few of the observations that really stood out for me were being really clear about our objectives when it comes to anti-corruption programming, considering these objectives in a well-specified theory of change that's grounded in a, a nuanced sort of systems-driven approach, um, and, and that that itself is linked to indicators that are well-designed and that track, test, and allow us to really adapt um, and be nimble in how we use our theories of change. We also really need to promote a culture of learning where we're curious about how we're, we're making changes, how we can adapt our MEL to account for gender and social norms, where we're open to and we create opportunities to understand those factors that drive our successes and our failures, and, and that this culture of learning really involves all voices involved in the change, um, that they're very inclusive and equitable. And um, this is all the more true when we deepen our work in integrating our anti-corruption approaches into sectors, where we need to think in a greater level of granularity to, to better understand those meaningful components of change to address corruption in the sectors. How can we translate these learning findings in a way that's meaningful to our sectoral colleagues? 
Um, I also want to really thank our audience. I think the questions that you all asked for the session um, really enriched the discussion. So thank you so much for that. And on that point, um, we hope that you will stay online and join us for the next session where we'll have a chance to unpack all of these reflections from the week and your own priorities to improve anti-corruption evidence and learning moving forward. So with that, I'll hand the floor back to Jen, um, who's going to give us a preview of what's next. Great, thank you so much, Sky and Janine, for your excellent moderation, and to Sherry, Johannes, and Paola, Paola for this fantastic discussion. Um, you've really laid out some of the challenges and the next steps in terms of refining how we measure our collective progress against corruption, and I'd like to thank you for all your expertise. It's clear we have a lot to do. Um, I encourage our broader community listening here that as you've thought through some of how we can improve our measure, measurement and evidence in this space, please bring us your thoughts and ideas. We're all learning ourselves um, and we are, would be grateful for your thoughts. 